Hi, everyone, and thank you so much for joining me today to uh, learn about key concepts in ecology for site design. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and we'll get started. So to get started, uh, I want to extend my gratitude to Half Moon Education for having me present today. If anyone has any questions, please feel free to reach out to me on Gmail, LinkedIn, or Twitter or X. On the slide in front of you, you are looking at uh, urban structures or urban site designs that include habitat for wildlife. On the left is in um, Oklahoma City, and on the right is in Salem, Oregon. Both of these places are uh, designed to include spaces for insects, uh, amphibians, lizards, and it's just a really great example of the things that we can do with a little bit of planning. So before we get too far into this talk, a uh, real quick background on me is that I have a master's in botany, a PhD in zoology, where I focus on landscape ecology and pollinators. I've worked on a number of projects looking at bee community structures, native plant communities, monarch butterflies, and their ecology, as well as a few other random here and there topics. In addition to that, I've worked in conservation from coast to coast, including California, Nevada, Oklahoma, Ohio, New York, and Connecticut. With all the work that I've done, all the research that I've done, I'm hopefully going to be able to coalesce a lot of that information into useful topics and techniques for you all to apply in landscape development that supports wildlife in our urban environments. For the talk today, I'm going to start off with uh, some basic ecology and habitat succession, and then explain that a little bit further so we have a better basis to move forward with. Then we'll start talking about natural processes, improving landscape design to build habitat, and then creating structure with natural woods, mulch, soil, and stone that ends up creating habitat within our overall landscape design. Last, we'll finish up with some seasonal maintenance, uh, also known as small scale disturbance, and that'll include pruning, trimming, and sculpting plants, and some of that will also be peppered throughout the presentation. So to start off with, uh, most people learn about ecosystems and habitats um, with a model like this, where meadows are early successional stages, and then you have shrublands and early forests, which then climax in a forest uh, ecosystem. Although this is very helpful to get us to understand the way plant communities do move through the landscape, uh, it really gives us a false understanding of the actual habitats that exist in these areas. And that's because that kind of succession only happens once. And then when some sort of disturbance moves through, the resources that those plant communities built or created are left behind. And the animals that live in the plant communities are used to those structures being present as well. So a better way to think about habitat succession and uh, habitats overall is to ask ourselves what should be in these landscapes. Another way to think about this is when we see articles talking about creating habitat, especially for pollinators and birds that are focused on plants, they give us this picture on the left, but they're not really providing an overall understanding of habitat that these animals require to have successful life cycles. So, a better model for habitat is shown on the right. Another thing to understand about this is as plant communities shift, they're not shifting the entire landscape. As a community shifting event occurs, it's creating different types of disturbance across the entire landscape, sometimes leaving places untouched, so you still have that climax community forest, um, and other places burning into the ground and exposing, you know, um, knocking everything down, exposing the ground to the sun and allowing herbaceous plant communities to grow back. This whole thing is known as a shifting landscape mosaic. And it's important to understand when we're trying to do uh, management of areas, and we'll get into this in a little bit, um, but the idea that our landscapes are supposed to be changing is important for the health of wildlife. Uh, similarly, in deserts, the same idea is happening, just in a little bit different. And instead of us climaxing with forests, the climax plant community is typically a creosote bush uh, or a yucca-dominated uh, desert kind of landscape. But we still have herbaceous and annual plants showing up originally, then as 
conditions are correct, some of our perennials are able to establish and become the dominant plant in the overall community. When a community shifting event occurs in the desert and in many grasslands that are fire adapted, it's important to remember that a lot of the underground structures still persist, and this creates different types of microhabitats for animals to utilize, as well as facilitate the recolonization of those areas because most of those plants didn't actually die, they seem to regrow from their stems. So moving into our gardens or industrial landscapes, when we start designing an area and we're only thinking about the plant list or even the xeriscape rock structures that we put out, that isn't necessarily going to give us a good idea of what animals can live in the landscapes that we've designed. A better way to think about this is to ask what do these animals need and is there a way to incorporate it into the landscape? And this includes shelter for winter and summer, microhabitats for life stages, including water, nesting sites, and then of course, prey habitat, prey or overall food, like plants for uh, caterpillars to eat or flowers for pollinators. When we're looking at the way the overall landscape should be shifting and the succession of plant communities, in a natural setting, all ecosystems should have that transient vegetation community where if you were to look at the same acre for hundreds of years, you would see different plant communities mature through and be disturbed out of that area and the wildlife that are dependent on those plant communities as well, moving with those habitats as they shift through the landscape. This is driven by abiotic events as well as some biotic events. Uh, for example, in all areas, including deserts, you have small sporadic rainfall, which is going to influence some areas to have more rain. You're going to have localized droughts. We're going to have long-term landscape level droughts. There are going to be fires. There are going to be heavy frost. And there are, of course, going to be pest outbreaks, all of which driving that plant community shift. However, if when we're outside and looking at the natural world, it's important to understand if we are actually in a natural environment or if we are in a managed environment. Even in our national parks and our wildlands, we often are in spaces that are managed and the way that we manage those areas is similar to the way that we manage our industrial landscapes and our gardens, which is suspending the plant succession. And we do this by changing or regulating the interval of disturbance. And it, we're prioritizing that habitat over the overall ecosystem. And this prevents populations from moving around, including the plants as well as the wildlife that are dependent upon those habitats and the organisms that feed on different wildlife are able to build up as well as diseases. And this becomes a problem. Similarly, when we are not allowing the natural processes to move through, we're interrupting nutrient cycles. So soils can become devoid of important nutrients and habitats will eventually degrade over time. The photo that you're looking at here on the screen is a picture of Lee Meadows. This is in Nevada, about 35 miles away from Las Vegas Strip at 8,000 feet on Mount Charleston. This space has been managed as a meadow for over 100 years. And when I was out there working in 2011, we were tasked with trying to reinvigorate this meadow to bring back plants for the uh, Mount Charleston Blue Butterfly, which was under consideration for listing with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. While we were out there, I started to realize that this meadow didn't look like any of the other meadows that we had been working in that were not managed and were simply occurring after a fire. The more that I looked at this space, you could see that the soils had been degraded, they'd been compacted, invasive species were coming in and really just mowing everything down. This is not mowed by humans. It's literally kept this short by horses and the deer that live in the area. There are no logs, there are no pine trees, there's no saplings, there's nothing bringing nutrients back into the system to rebuild those soils. So they've also been able to wash away over the century that it's been managed this way. In contrast, the meadows that exist when a fire comes through that's only five or six years old, uh, you can see that there's just supposed to be taller grasses, taller shrubs, and the trees are supposed to be regrowing and turning back into a forest where possible. So by interrupting that nutrient cycle, because they've been managing that habitat to be a meadow for so long, there needs to be new steps brought in that reinvigorate that meadow to rebuild those soils and bring those nutrient cycles back in so that the meadow can stay healthy. 
bringing this into our gardens and our landscapes, it's a, important to understand when we are managing any of the areas, what those habitats or plant communities would naturally be succeeding into, and then try and figure out ways to reinvigorate the processes that we are no longer allowing to occur. In a lot of our arid west designs and xeriscapes, we will see um, a lot of really nice landscape designs that we can simply augment a little bit to make them even, uh, to make them wildlife friendly, if not more wildlife friendly, depending on where we're at with the design to begin with. Many of these designs include lots of rock and weed liners, uh, which unfortunately doesn't provide a lot of space for wildlife to live, especially those that are fossorial or need to be underground. They do include clear borders. There's a lot of structure built with vertical, uh, vertical structure built with plants, some of which require pruning to keep that structure. There's also a lot of barren space with no habitat for wildlife. Again, that dirt isn't really being utilized in a way that is thinking about how wildlife might utilize it and how to improve it for, for habitat. Within our designs and within our urban landscapes, there's also a lot of natural resources that wildlife need that we remove simply because we think that it's a threat to human safety, and in most cases it is not. This includes soil diversity, depth, texture, and slope. Native plant communities, of course, are typically removed and replaced with horticultural plants. Ecosystem engineers, especially burrowing animals, are extirpated from our urban environments. Caves and crevices are often filled in or uh, removed. And then large clean temporary water resources are often polluted or filled in because of the concern of mosquitoes. Last is we typically remove wood and woody materials and leaf litter because many people see it as unsightly or messy. And instead of organizing it, we just remove it. But we start thinking about our landscape designs um, and how to better mimic the natural world that is still aesthetically pleasing, the best place to start is the ground. And in the arid west, there are, of course, some areas that have really shallow soils, but for the most part, many of the soils that should be existing are deep, and plants can grow four to five foot, um, five feet into the ground with their roots, uh, which is helping them pull up moisture when it's really dry outside. Uh, it's creating spaces for animals to burrow into and escape the heat as well as the cold. So when we're designing areas in the urban landscape, especially if there have been uh, heavy amounts of soil augmentation, like clays being brought in for stability to build on, and then add cold, uh, or soils are brought in for lawns or some level of landscaping, those are often too shallow. So it's important that garden beds are deep enough that the plants are reaching to levels that they are accustomed to and providing space for water to seep into the ground and animals to escape the abiotic factors that they need to escape from. Shallow soils are also going to lead to plants getting sick. They'll look fine for a while, but then they'll become root bound, or they will simply just be exposed to hot temperatures or too cold of temperatures once they start to mature and the plants will get sick and die. And we don't want that to happen either. So make sure that when you're prepping an area or designing an area, like we see here on the left, the soil beds are deep enough for the plants to succeed for a long period of time and throughout their natural life cycle. When we're developing soils, typically in the landscape, when people are thinking about plants, we aim for this clay loam or sandy clay loam, which is uh, plotted out here on a ternary diagram. This is one way to classify soils where you plot the percent of silt, sand, and clay present inside of uh, the soils that are being used. However, in a natural environment, there's typically a diversity of soils and not just soils specific for plants, but they are going to be sandy clay areas, there's going to be silty areas, the wind sorts things, water sorts soil, the organic materials that decay uh, affect what's going on. Inside of the ternary diagram, we are not capturing a lot of other factors that are important for soil, which includes compactness, organic material, um, or even pH. But it is at least a beginning to understand that 
in a natural environment, there should be a diversity of soils. And some of this comes around because of the way natural processes happen. And as an aside, if your landscape is trying to build space for pollinators, the bee nests that are in the ground that have been described typically fall in the sand, heavy sand or heavy clay uh, soils. So we want to make sure that we're including those in our designs and deep enough for bees to be nesting and being able to carry out their life cycles. In the natural world, the way that soils diversify inside of ecosystems happen in a number of different ways, including fire, leaf litter, water washing things away. As trees fall over, they pull up nutrient-rich soil into a brand new slope and aspect. They expose nutrient-poor soils underneath, often collecting water, uh, organic debris, and creating a new place for soils to start nutrient cycles and plants to colonize. Similarly, uh, burrowing animals bring up nutrient-poor soils that get scattered around the overall area. Various birds hunt in this area. It starts a new nutrient cycle. Plants that are okay growing in nutrient-poor soils establish their first, and the, uh, the overall process of plant community development starts all over again. Another thing to keep in mind when we're talking about soil is overall topography. And it's important because in the natural world, like in the desert of the Southwest, when creosote bushes die off and start to collapse, they leave these little pockets in a very flat surface. These little pockets allow the rain to run off and collect, and it's just enough extra water for pollinator oases to form, as you see in this photo here. Similarly, in mountainous regions, you'll see uh, areas where there's been some little bit of dipping in the topography. These often become fern fens um, or just a little bit more wet than the surrounding ecosystem. And again, trees fall over, which are going to create dips and rises in the soil. This vertical soil in the tree roots is going to be utilized by a number of arthropods and birds for nesting and hunting. In contrast, when we are looking at reclaimed agricultural lands or even massive projects that try and restore areas, you'll see that it's flat. There's not a lot of topography, not even the little pits and divots that are important for seed establishment. So when we are trying to do large scale things, it's important to remember we want these uneven surfaces for seeds and vegetation communities to better persist in the landscape. Here on the top right, we're looking at an old agricultural field that uh, was abandoned about 90 years before this photo was taken, and a forest has uh, been able to grow in that space, and the old road, old carriage road, is still here. But the more that you look at it, if you start to understand that there should be topography, it's incredibly smooth, and it'll probably take 200, 300 years for the processes of trees falling over, logs decaying, to really build back the natural structure that should have been there that was removed when it was under agricultural use. Native plant communities, um, there are lovely native plant communities all over the West Coast, all over the world, that we can really take as inspiration for our garden designs and then bring those native plants into our urban landscapes to better support the wildlife that should be existing in our areas, as well as plants that are going to survive just the weather patterns that exist in our urban environments that will survive the droughts, will survive the rainstorms, and just cost us less money to uh, try and maintain. When you're designing a landscape, it's best to use native plants as much as possible. I am not, and most researchers are not, the kind of, there's no data showing that you need to be 100% native plants. Uh, about 70% is the target, according to Doug Tallamy's work. Based on the research that I have done, it seems to be a good rough estimate that, yes, because animals aren't using all of the plants in all of the landscape, about 70% is a good target, and then the other 30% is great for using, you know, to add splashes of color that you may want or food for uh, urban environments. There's different reasons not to use native plants, but try and use them as much as possible. When designing spaces, do not ignore the typical design architecture guidelines. You know, keep borders neat, keep plants structured well, include layers so that it's an interesting environment to look at. And this will prevent the issue that a lot of um, 
first time native plant designers come into where they mistake using native plants with a wildscape. And we can still organize our native plants in a way that they are attractive and beautiful to look at. And although a wildscape can be that way too, it can also be perceived as really messy and go against many city ordinances and we don't want that to happen. When choosing plants for a landscape, it's important to consider five main uh, characteristics. That includes range and suitability. Do these plants grow in the area that you're trying to design? And are they suitable for the overall abiotic environments that are present? Just because a plant grows in that range doesn't mean it's going to grow in the soil, the light exposure, or the water availability that is present on the landscape design. Pay attention to the growth habit, flower and bloom period. Some plants sprawl, some plants grow as shrubs. It's kind of a no-brainer, but it is important to keep in mind because a lot of native plants already hold really good form that doesn't need to be maintained if we pick them appropriately. Similarly, if you're trying to do pollinator gardens or bird gardens, when those plants are blooming or producing seed is going to feed that wildlife. And we want to try and create as much food resources as possible for our wildlife throughout the growing season and winter for our animals that are active in the winter. <clears throat> Consider which pollinators and which insects are going to utilize those plants. Not all plants are created equal. Uh, in my most recent book, I list out for many of the common plants used in landscapes, some of the bees that have, or all of the bees that have been reported to be associated with those flowers. Uh, purple coneflower is a great example where people often think it's a great pollinator plant. And although it is a really good resource for some pollinators like bumblebees and honeybees, there's not a lot of bees that typically visit those flowers. However, those cone flowers do produce a lot of seeds that uh, birds like. They are also a host plant for butterfly species. Important for the landscape, but they're not really that pollinator workhorse that people think they are versus, you know, fire wheels or even monardas. Um, also consider how birds and other wildlife will use them. Uh, especially when you have a lot of deer in the area. If deer are going to browse them a lot, there needs to be some either fencing put up or other choices made. Last is the response to trimming. Many, many, many pieces of, or many species of native plants tolerate trimming because they're typically browsed by big herbivores. Texas sage is a great example where this plant is often chosen for industrial landscapes and then heavily shaped into topiaries. And that does not affect the quality of the forage for the moths that live on this. It does not prevent it from flowering and supporting the bees that feed on the flowers. So when you're choosing plants, understand that some plant, some species of flowers are not going to tolerate trimming like the sunflowers in this photo, but other ones can really be shaped. and by choosing ones that can be shaped heavily, that allows us to really show that our landscape designs are intentional and continue to keep that industrial look that some people really like while still supporting our wildlife habitats. As an aside, anyone who is going to be charged with developing a butterfly garden in their designs, there are some key aspects to this that are often overlooked or even there's just misinformation on. First and foremost, you want to make sure you're selecting plants that are native to your area and supporting butterflies. Tropical milkweed is an example that is quite often used in landscapes, but it is not native, and it is being shown to cause a lot more problems than we were expecting it to. In addition to this, we want to make sure our host plants are spread out and at least planted with another species of plant that won't be eaten by those caterpillars. And this is because when our butterfly gardens are successful, caterpillars come in and they eat everything. And if there is no intermixed planting, what we end up having is a garden bed full of sticks and a lot of exposed ground, which people don't necessarily like. This also becomes a problem because there's no place for the caterpillars to safely pupate, and they might end up pupating on a nearby shrub that then gets eaten down. They are then exposed to the sun and are cooked and no longer make it to becoming a butterfly. A better design is what you see up here on the top right, where there's an intermix of native milkweeds with non-milkweed plants, as well as non-native uh, flowering species that were simply used to create a beautiful palette that people wanted to look at 
And this supported monarchs, swallowtails, all sorts of uh, native bees and birds, and was right next to a subway station in New York, which was fantastic to see almost every day when I was living there. And then, of course, make sure that where you're putting your pollinator gardens is not going to be next to heavily um, managed lawns or places that are going to use a lot of pesticides. And pesticides include herbicides, fungicides, and insecticides. All three of those are harmful to insects in different ways. <clears throat> talking about going back and talking about some of the removed resources that we see in the landscape, um, burrowing animals that create deep shelters that a number of other organisms are dependent upon are typically removed from our landscapes, but they're easy enough to reincorporate into site designs. The easiest way to do it, of course, is if you are going to build a raised bed, go ahead and start building tunnels and uh, caves that animals can access and then build the entrances into the landscape so that it is aesthetically pleasing. You can, however, dig these into the ground and then cover them up again if you want to. The things to keep in mind is that the hideaways uh, should have strong walls and strong ceilings so that they don't collapse. Uh, Make sure that they're covered by at least a foot or more of soil, especially if they're being exposed to direct sunlight. This will prevent that, that space from becoming an oven and cooking anything, taking refuge in there. Similarly, these spaces will be used in the winter by all sorts of arthropods that need to pupate or spend the winter in a stage of their life cycle and then emerge the following year. Tunnels should be two inches larger than your target wildlife. If you're lucky enough to live in an area where there are tortoises, which are already burrowers, um, or box turtles if you're not on the West Coast, these spaces, you just take the, the mature animal size and make sure that if it was to walk into that tunnel, it could turn around and leave. Failing to do that will cause animals to get stuck and die, and that is the exact opposite of what we're trying to do when we're creating these habitats. Lastly, incorporate loose soil on the bottom of your tunnels or at the end of your tunnels so that animals can kind of scurry down a little bit more. Most animals that don't excavate burrows still will move soil around a little bit just to insulate themselves for that extra um, little bit to create the microhabitats they need for their life. Similarly, caves are typically removed from our landscapes and we can create them either underground or above ground. If you want to create caves underground, we can borrow some of the conservation tools used by various tortoise organizations as well as burrowing owls. And the most common structure they use is the top of very large dog kennels. They cover those over with soil or mulch and then disguise the entrance with rocks so that it blends in the landscape. You can plant on those mounds as well and cover everything up. And voila, you have a space for those animals to spend the majority of their day where they would naturally be doing that. Similarly, if you want to build caves on top of the soil, creating beautiful rock scapes, as long as they are solid, it's going to support lizards, it's going to support all sorts of arthropods, it's going to support toads, and in wetter areas, many amphibians. Again, we want to make sure that there are sturdy walls and sturdy ceilings. You want to have loose soil or um, organic material on the bottom for animals to kind of push their way into. <clears throat> and if you're trying to recreate in the vertical soils, it's easiest to do that in uh, raised beds, but for the most part, I don't recommend trying to recreate vertical soils simply because the chance of them collapsing or the erosion factor is too high and, and they're really hard to maintain. However, we can start to double up in our urban landscapes on things that look one way, but can also provide habitat in another way. So for example, in our zero state, rockscape kind of designs that many landscapers use. There's wheat cloth, then there's gravel on top, then there's heavy rocks. Those heavy rocks typically are set on soil with no space provided underneath for animals to get under to seek refuge. Luckily, with a few changes, we can have the same overall design, but make it wildlife friendly. <laughs> In cases when weed liner is used, we simply want to make sure that there's a hole underneath the rocks so that the soil is exposed and do it in a way that won't allow plants necessarily to grow, but the animals can get into. Similarly, the soil that is underneath those rocks should be, can be modified so that animals can burrow into it, 
nest in nest in those areas for nesting bees and we'll have that same look but it's now going to be supportive for toads for bunnies for lizards and our bees and it can be done on any kind of rock uh that's just large enough for the space uh in addition to these kinds of rockscapes as much as people like to put them in, they're really not good habitat for anything, even with these soil amendments. So adding native plants to the area will help attract more and more species to the landscape that we have designed. Another tactic that a lot of landscapers use, especially in larger spaces, are these um, crater water wells for plants that are, are uh, put into the landscape. And this is fantastic for capturing water, for holding water and letting it slowly seep, seep into the soil and get deep into the roots. However, we can also improve upon this so that we're doubling up on the habitat that we're creating, which is important for small spaces. So an example for a, just a backyard gardener, they was using this kind of crater well option. The problem they were consistently having is the number of weeds that would show up and they couldn't bring their mower in to cut those weeds close enough and a weed whacker has too much potential for damaging the trunk so they were just allowing those weeds to grow. A solution to this was to weed out all those weeds, put in some supportive structures like these large rocks which were are going to support a layer on top. We uh, filled in the matrix with mulch so that water could still percolate into this area and fill that space, as well as allow the animals that we were targeting with this one specifically being the Texas toad, spadefoot toads, and some crickets. Uh, but those, all those animals will be able to move in that, that space and escape the water when it is irrigated. A strong material needs to be placed on top of that, which again, the water can get through, but it will support another layer of material that we're going to place on top. Secure everything with your border, however you want to do that, and then fill with rocks. So in this instance, and this works on a larger landscape scale, we are creating a space that can be irrigated, that doesn't need to be weeded, and it's going to support a bunch of wildlife. And it looks nice. A side view of what's going on is you still keep all of the same soil uh, structures down here. You make sure that the root flare is not impinged by new soils or um, the layers that are added. There are support rocks to keep that layer on top from crushing and sinking, and then materials on top of that supportive layer, which is going to, just going to provide shade and allow water through, as well as just create a nice aesthetic for the area. <clears throat> for recreating water resources that are typically removed, Large, clean, temporary water resources in our urban environments are typically hard to find. And this is because even the spaces, like I showed you on the first cover slide, that is runoff from a parking lot, which is going to be polluted from salts that are trying to prevent freezing, as well as all the chemicals from cars. Other spaces to put these in are uh, next to large walkway patios uh, by buildings and capture the roof runoff that isn't necessarily going to be polluted by cars. You want to create deep enough basins with rough edges so that animals can crawl out when it fills with water or when it is filled with water and they fall, fall in. For spaces that, like a rain garden, uh, you want to make sure that you're using native plants that tolerate inundation. The USDA has a uh, ranking system for floodplain plants and ones that are going to be appropriate for this type of planting are going to be registered as FAC or FAC wet. In areas where many animals require temporary bodies of water for their life cycle, you can also capture water in an impervious surface, but you want to make sure that it's at least nine inches deep, there is some shade so that this water doesn't bake in the sun, and then of course vegetation on the side for animals like many amphibians that need that vegetation to attach their eggs to. Again, in the urban environment, using roof runoff is perfect for this. You want to make sure it's far enough away from the house so you're not disturbing your foundation. And then in these large rain capture gardens like this, these typically aren't designed to hold water for a long period of time, but to improve the water um, input into the soil or to at least slow down the inundation into the waterways. This can also be modified, this kind of space can be modified to include small areas that will hold water for a long periods of time to allow 
insects and amphibians to carry out their life cycles as needed. In our landscapes, we typically remove wood as well, but it's really easy to incorporate that back into our gardens. Uh, quite often, I see landscapers using large tree pieces. Um, if you're ever lucky enough to find a huge root flare that gets cleaned off, these make stunning centerpieces. But the reason to include them is because of the number of animals that need wood in their life cycle. And a lot of our processes uh, already are adding that wood resource back in. We just didn't realize that that's what we were mimicking. So bird houses and bee hotels mimic wood in the environment. This is because the bee hotels in the wild, there are wood, uh, wood eating beetles that create these tunnels. When they mature, they leave the, the dead wood that has a new opening and be, bees are able to go in there and build their nests. There are different diameters, different tunnel lengths that bees utilize for this. Building similar structures and placing them in our gardens is an easiest way to replace that. However, there is this idea of creating these massive bee hotels or buying these commercially available ones. And this is not really replicating what happens in the wild. And instead is creating too short of a tube for our bees to actually be having a healthy population. Smaller widths generally have shorter nests. So you can correlate the lower diameter with shorter nests and larger diameters, not going above five sixteenths, eight sixteenths of an inch or a half inch. Um, tunnels about five sixteenths of an inch are best and then going to nine inches long and then four inches long for smaller ones. The reason this is bad for bees is solitary bees are able to control the sex of the eggs that they lay. So females are laid further down in the tunnels and then the last few cells of the tunnel are going to be male. In these short bee hotels, these become male dominated. This creates a lot of harassment for the female bees. And it also provides a very, very tight buffet for anything that eats bees, including funguses, pollen mites, and predatory bees that usurp those nests. So try and avoid the commercially available bee hotels, either make your own or select the bee hotels that are specific for mason bees. Another way that we can kind of double up our spaces is to integrate soil diversity in our overall landscape designs. So this can be scaled up, but this is a backyard garden where uh, food garden plots are being put in next to native plants. And underneath these large borders, there's just a lot of space that wasn't being used. And again, it creates that tight seal with the typical ways that borders and rocks are placed in these landscape designs. A way to improve that is to maintain the structure of these kinds of things, but diversify it. So in the center of this, all we did is dug out about 18 inches deep, filled it with untreated mulch or chemically untreated mulch to replicate the decaying stumps that should be present in this kind of landscape and then covered it with a little bit of soil and then put the rock right back over. Looks the same, no major differences, but we've now created a space for integrative pest management where toads, lizards, and uh, other predatory animals that feed on insects that would be harming this food garden are able to seek shelter and benefit from the irrigation that occurs. When designing an area with native plants, it's also important to understand how the landscape around it fits creating even in a small space a really good habitat with lots of plant diversity if there's no other habitat around isn't going to really support that that system that we're trying to because they can't get there uh, so always pay attention to the overall landscape that's going on of course use native plants in the landscape as much as possible follow the design architecture guidelines that are typical in our gardens already or our um, industrial landscape designs Consider the relative access from the wildlife. So are there already forested areas where birds are gonna be able to come in? Are there already natural areas where bees might be living that they'd be able to colonize? And if those pieces aren't in the landscape yet, just be aware that the success for this garden might not be as, how to put this, <clears throat> the wildlife colonization that we would expect to see might not be 
fast or reach the, reach the numbers that we would hope for if we were in an area closer to natural areas. For people who are working in small spaces or without a large budget, I recommend installing one bed at a time and then start with on larger spaces, planting your shrubs and your large rocks first. This way those can be installed, people can see what you're doing is intentional and you can build off from there instead of working in a construction zone, sometimes for months, if not years. Always make sure you have clear borders. You can do this with mowing, you can do it with landscape materials like rocks, you can do it with plants and straight lines. There's no right way to make a border, but as long as it's a clear border, that's important to use. Keep things most orderly near your roads or your parking lots or anywhere that people are going to be viewing that space to know that what you're doing is intentional. And then if you need to put up signage, you can do that as well. Use shrubs and trees as well as rocks and low growing herbaceous plants, woods and all those things to build the structures that you want. So again, that everything's aesthetically pleasing, but it's now providing habitat for the wildlife that may have been ignored previously. For those of you who are lucky enough to work on large projects that may involve a lot of seeding, a uh, thing to keep in mind is that topography that we talked about earlier, where there should be divots, there should be uh, differences in the overall structure. Similarly, when we look at the way that ecosystems should naturally be proceeding, there should be, you know, structures creating shade and uh, wind breaks that's going to improve and increase the biodiversity of seedling establishment. So once a area is reseeded, make sure to include, you know, various uh, detritus or pieces of wood or even stone that is going to help shade those areas or keep the soils cool while those plants are starting to grow. For areas that need to be pruned or trimmed or mowed, keeping in mind the uh, resources that animals are using and not disturbing those resources during the periods that they're going to be used. So you don't want to mow a meadow or mow a really good pollinator garden in the height of bloom, not only because you're removing all the blooms, but it's going to kill off all the insects that are dependent on those flowers. Uh, similarly, trimming of trees and everything, you want to make sure it'd be happening at a time when it's least in use by animals that we're trying to support with our designs. With any of the wildlife that we're looking at, we also wanna make sure that the resources that they're using are kept fresh. So we wanna you know, replace bee hotels every two or three years. We wanna clean out nest boxes every year to make sure that there aren't any dead birds inside. We wanna make sure the clean water bodies are clean and not developing bacteria infections or going stagnant, those kinds of things. Going above and beyond that, you can think about the large megafauna that should be present in these landscapes and how to bring back their existence into the landscape. Uh, bison are a really great example because they covered so much of North America. They're not really on the West Coast, but they're just a really good example to utilize. So bison are known for going through and trimming grasses back throughout the summer as they are eating, and that allows for flowering plants to be able to grow above those cutback grasses. They're also trampling everything in the winter, which helps knock down vegetation, uh, providing less space for the sun to, or how to put this, when vegetation is knocked down, there is less area that plants have to grow through to reach the sunlight, or in most, in some cases, it even allows sunlight to get to the ground. When vegetation communities are left standing without any disturbances because these animals have been removed and humans aren't walking through it, then we end up creating spaces that a lot of annual plants can't establish the next year. So we don't want to do that. Uh, instead, to mimic this, we can cut back herbaceous growth by about 25% once during the growing season, and we can do it again in the winter as well. Trim back grasses and herbaceous perennials that have sprouts coming back from the roots to about one third the height in the winter, uh, one third of their height, and do this in the winter. And this will help provide support for the next year's growth as it emerges. <laughs> Quite often, people mistake native plants. Um, need for nutrients as something that's just going to naturally occur in the environment. But as we talked about earlier with us, the way that we manage most of our ecosystems, those processes aren't there. So we do actually need to fertilize our areas, but we just don't need to do it the way that we 
wood fertilizing area for her horticultural plants or food plots. So use natural fertilizers or teas to reintroduce nutrients, but this only needs to be done, you know, every few years, three to five years is a good uh, pattern for full sun plants that are mimicking meadows. If you're using mulch, don't use dyed mulch or chemically treated mulch. And you can spread this across areas as well, just lightly to reintroduce nutrients to slowly break down and work back into the soil. Last, I wanna focus on pesticides. Some of the research that I've worked on during my postdoc really showed that it's a synergy of chemicals that are taking down our insect populations. It's not just the use of a single insecticide or a single fungicide. It's when fungicides and insecticides are used together and the animals are experiencing them in non-lethal doses in the, in the wild, their immune systems are getting dropped. Their reproduction is being affected. They're having a higher death rate. So all of these things work together to really decrease their populations. So when you're creating habitat, for animals, especially trying to include pollinators, we need to make sure that we are limiting the use of pesticides, making sure that we're using smart choices, including the time of day that they're applied um, and the amount that's being used. At no point should an entire space be covered in, in a pesticide or fungicide, unless there's some massive outbreak and that's the only way to control it. But in most cases, treating a quarter of the space letting that rest, treating another quarter of that space, letting it rest, will be able to eradicate the problem while also allowing the populations in the area to, to persist that we want to persist in the environment. In conclusion, I hope that you all have enjoyed this talk and that you were able to walk away from this with the ideas that landscape designs can create habitat. It only takes careful integration of native plants, incorporating soil diversity within our overall designs, providing underground and above ground shelters and including rocks and wood in a way that animals can still utilize them that are also aesthetically pleasing to the viewer. And with that, I will happily answer any questions. Unfortunately, I can't be here today, so this is pre-recorded, but please feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn. You can find me under Sean McCosham. You can reach out to me on Twitter under McCoshSM or Gmail, which is McCoshSM at gmail.com. If any of this uh, truly interests you and you want to do some further reading, I have published a book on talking about creating habitats uh, or and the ways that animals and plants interact. And that's present here on the screen too. Thank you all again. And I really appreciate you coming to this talk.